Created in 2005 and hosted by security industry veterans, Paul Security Weekly is your source for in-depth coverage of the latest vulnerabilities, exploits, and security research. Our weekly security news discussion dives deep into the security issues we face today and potential solutions in a fun and lively atmosphere. Each week, we bring on guests from the security community to learn about their journey and discuss topics relevant to their work and research. You can also subscribe to our show by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe or look for Paul Security Weekly in your favorite podcast catcher. We've recorded a ton of content over the years, so we created Spotify playlists featuring some of our favorite episodes, including interviews with Marcus Random, John McAfee, and Chris Roberts, to name a few. You can find them at securityweekly.com forward slash starter packs. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. We just talked with Farshad Abbasi about the XZ Utils backdoor and some lessons we could learn and should learn from that. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and we've convinced Farshad to stick around for the news. But first, he has to sit through two announcements, as do all of you. I apologize. But Security Weekly listeners, you can save $100 on your RSA Conference 2024 whole conference pass. Conference will take place May 6th through 9th in San Francisco and on demand. To register using our discount code, visit securityweekly.com slash RSAC24 and use the code 54USECWEEKLY. We hope to see you there. I'll be there in person. Come say hi. And to ensure that you don't lose access to the Security Weekly content you know and love like this very podcast, please make sure your favorite podcast feeds are up to date. Google's podcast catcher, whatever they're calling it, is going away. So do visit securityweekly.com slash subscribe to find the buttons to subscribe to each show and do it now. And while everyone is going and updating their um, podcast feeds, Farshad, we have to go through and talk about some news. There's, um, speaking of 20 years ago, so we, we had lots of fun with our, with our uh, 2004 news of the week for our April <laughs> Fool's episode. And there's an article here that, feels a little bit like almost Microsoft of 20 years ago. So the Avanti CEO vows cybersecurity makeover after a zero-day blitz. And um, yeah, they've they've been in the news and they've had several vulns. And the vulns themselves seem pretty, like they've had SQL injection, lots of bad things. And one of the bad things, you know, how technical detailed is that? But what I really (laughs) wanted to pull, pull out to is, you know, this year we've also had Critical zero days fixed in, uh, you know, this year and last year in, in Chrome, in Safari, in iOS, in Android. But that feels different from Avanti. And I've got some reasons why it feels different from me. But if I frame it that way, does that start to, you know, what what does this make you feel about the the trust or should we, you know, the, the types of vulns that are coming up? If it's just like, if we're seeing SQL injection in 2024. Does that instill confidence or not? Yeah, definitely not. I mean, these are things that should have been addressed a long time ago. And these guys are, you know, going through that Microsoft moment of 2002, 2003, where there were just so many security vulnerabilities. And then they had to basically drop everything and, and focus on that, which I think is what's yeah. happening with Avanti right now. They're just saying, hey, we're going to drop everything and work on security. But is that really enough? I mean, <laughs> you know, it's it's like their security company and should these have even happened that's sort of the, you know, this is not 2004, it's 2024. Um, you know, the world has changed and I don't think that should be acceptable. I think as consumers, we should put our foot down and not really accept that kind of, uh, that kind of inaction, if you will. I, I, I agree. And the reason I w- wanted to kind of frame it with the idea of, well, we have these critical patches and all these other things, but we also see from Chrome, from app, you know, Safari, things like the sandboxing. We've talked about the miracle pointers that Chrome has been adopting. We've seen about rewriting, uh, you know, even the Linux kernel and um, rewriting its device drivers into Rust. We've seen Chrome, Firefox, you know, rewriting certain areas of their rendering into Rust. So we've yep. seen these types of yep. modern secure designs that have nothing to do with like, oh, we're sorry about that SQL injection since that we've known about since the 2003 OWASP top 10. We'll go and fix that. Um, yeah. So yeah, that that's where this just, just it doesn't feel, it doesn't instill confidence that it's, especially security company is dealing with that nature of vulnerabilities. Exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. We also, speaking of the OWASP top 10, um, OWASP also had a data breach. So they were collecting resumes from around uh, 2006 to 2014, just as part of the way that they were, you know, confirming membership, showing membership. 
Um, but those resumes dating all the way, you know, from 2006 to 2014, 10 years later, uh, they've been leaked. This doesn't sound great. What's, you know, how, what, what's your, your, your feeling on this? And, you know, was your resume out there for one? Yeah, for, for mine wasn't there. Uh, mine is on the internet. But, you know, uh, principle of least privilege, you know, keep, a lot of those security principles come to mind uh, and minimizing how much data that you keep, right? Like the data yeah. that you don't need, why are you keeping it, right? Like if they collected resumes until 2014, that's 10 years ago. They're not needing them. They should have been deleted. So those are the kinds of things that come to mind. Some basic security principles weren't followed um, in that case. But uh, it's always easier said than done, though, because, you know, at first you'd laugh. You're like, oh, well, they're a security organization. How could this happen? The irony. Them? But in yeah, reality, exactly. stuff can happen to anyone, you know, just... And that's one of the things I wanted to, to to pull out of this too. So thank you for 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 putting it that way because we you know one of our editorial takes here, one of our approaches is we like to celebrate transparency and especially security companies saying this is what happened, this is what we're going to do. Avanti didn't really have a lot of meaty. It has some it has some good areas that they were talking about um, about what they're going to do in the future that speak to secure design, et cetera, et cetera. But I think to your point, talking about the OWASP now, yeah, the thing that stood out for me, you haven't been using this data for 10 years. Why was it sitting around? And I think part of what I wanted to emphasize there too is if we're just worried about top 10 lists, I'm going to have to tease OWASP a little bit, or checklists, those aren't necessarily processes or tools that support processes, tooling that's supporting that. And I think that speaks to a little bit of what you and I were just discussing in the last segment is not so much how can we go and make sure that we trust everyone on the internet, how can we make sure that we have tools that are enforcing controls throughout whatever process we're doing? Obviously, with XZ, we were talking about building using code, so what are tools for Valgrind, OSS fuzz, for building reviews? And here, how do, why do we not have processes around, here's how data is collected, here's just the retention policy, here's how that retention policy is enforced through auto-deletion. You know, things like that. So that's why I wanted to point on that there's a lot of processes and tooling that failed the people in this scenario. And I was going to say, whenever those processes are manual, they're usually likely to fail. So you want to automate yeah. where you can, <laughs> you know, because if you say, hey, manually, I'm going to like review my retention, data retention once every year. Who's going to do it? People come and go, especially if it's a nonprofit organization. You need to try yeah. to see if you can automate those kinds of things, right? So have an automated script that runs. And if data is older than X, it gets, you know, punted essentially in that case, but. Automation, yeah, automation is so underappreciated, I think. And that's why I, I do like things like um, projects like the, 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 the ASVS and some of those other verification standards that are pointing more towards the process of what you're building um, from the secure pipeline that you were working on and talking about um, a couple months ago on the show with us, as well as the ASVS we just mentioned now. And I have an article about ASVS that I'm going to get to in a second. But first, talking about help with automation, maybe we can get some help with artificial intelligence uh, one of these <laughs> days. But um, this article specifically is from Hidden Layer, who's talking about prompt injection against um, artificial intelligence, against AI and, and, and machine, you know, LLMs. Sorry, that's the word I'm going for here. And it's not so much about how to do them, but it's one of those, it's a nice article that is just a good explainer of what's an LLM at a high level, what's the tokenization of all these words that get strung together basically in a probabilistic path, and then what are the types of prompt injection. And the reason I cared about the types, the difference between like a jailbreak versus a prompt link versus a prompt hijacking as they're describing them is that it's useful to have that language when we're talking about threat models. Because you also mentioned threat models in the last segment. And if I'm talking about the threat modeling of input validation for cross-site scripting versus SQL injection, those are actually very different. I'm going to argue that SQL injection is about prepared statements more so than an input validation. It doesn't matter what your characters are if you're using prepared statements. With cross-site scripting, I'm going to even argue that input validation doesn't even apply. It's immaterial because it's more about the output encoding of where you're rendering that data. And so that's why I get, uh, I'm going to use the pedantic word, it can be annoying perhaps, but hopefully helpfully annoying? I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll see. But that, that, that's where my mind goes when I care about you know these types of things about understanding what are we talking about. 
So Farshad, do you have any idea what I'm talking about here? Help me. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I mean, and uh, what I was going to emphasize in your point there is uh, when you're implementing controls, really looking at that threat scenario and seeing where it's most effective and the best to implement that control. Like I like your example about that SQL injection. If you're trying to do input validation, that's like, it's really difficult. The, the, you know, the characters might change that you need to validate, et cetera, et cetera. But using, um, you know, parameterized queries and things like that is, is a lot easier, more effective. So really looking at that attack chain, looking at the possible controls and then looking at which ones are your strongest, um, the most bang for your buck, if you will, um, you and where you should be putting them. So understanding the terminology so you can do that threat modeling and looking at things holistically is really important, as always. As always. And um, I like that you brought bang for your buck because money always is a source of uh, <laughs> AppSec concern here, whether metaphorically or not. Um, so that's a nice setup. Now, let's talk about some of that secure design. And I have an, it's not quite an article here. It's more of just a discussion on a on an issue for the OWASP ASVS. And it's really, well, let, let me set it up this way. I'll, I'll read the requirement. 2.10.1, verify that intra-service secrets do not rely on unchanging credentials, such as passwords or API keys. And there's an interesting conversation that comes out of this. It's 58 comments right now. Listeners in, in Farshad, you don't need to go read through every one. But the very first comment really just sets this up of, with the question of, what does this mean? And I thought this was a really good lesson for AppSec industry, AppSec folks, especially to say there's a big difference between go write secure code, uh, you know, don't have SQL injection, don't use you know unchanging secrets. When developers see that and they say, well, a design and implementation are as mutual TLS and unchanging secret, is that invalid? Does that not meet? the letter of this requirement, even if it may meet the spirit of it. I thought that was kind of an interesting way to appreciate the developer perspective. So yeah, when you look at this, how, how would you start to talk to developers who say like, Arshad, what does this mean? What's an unchanging, can't I, API keys are out there. I can't use the API key. Why not? Yeah. You know, it's really, it's a really good question, Mike. When I uh, I'll say this, you know me, I'm a big proponent of ASVS. I've built our whole company's foundation on ASVS and everything we do is based on ASVS. But I will also say this is that there's a lot of controls that are ambiguous. We've contributed uh, you know, a whole bunch of feedback into making them less ambiguous, but this is one of those ones where you read it is, what is the intention? Like, are you just want me to do this so that I don't hard code stuff? Are you asking me to do this because if I'm using unchanging credentials and they're in a config file or even protected with an HSM that someone discovers them and then they, sh you know, they should be rotated? Or is this more about something else? Like with a lot of times where I implement intrust service authentication, we do it with mutual TLS. That's a common way of doing it. Yeah. But here it hasn't really mentioned that, right? Like our certificate's okay. So what was the intention of this control? And that's not really clear. So this is where, you know, there's 50 plus comments trying to clarify that. But if I was looking at this, the, at the end of the day, why do you want to try to do something like this is because you don't want hard coded secrets. And you also want things that if uh, there's a possibility that a human can see it, then they need to rotate. Now, if you've had a hardware security module and you've protected this using some key material that's in there and it never leaves, well, that's okay. Like it can be unchanging, right? Because it's in that box. No one has ever seen it. Why would you change it? So really, you know, is based on ex exposure to humans and what that credential is, how it's used for in the context. So I would I would revise this control a bit differently to just sort of make it make the intention clear. I think that's one of the key things for ASVS, and then also differentiating between you know what controls are you know hey if you're using a certificate and the key material is protected in this way, or if the credential is protected using an HSM and you never see it and you can use it that way, maybe that's fine, right? So I think that's where some clarifications needed in a, in a, in a, in a recommendation like this. Yeah. And I think, you know, what, what is your intention? What's the intention of this is just a wonderful phrase to push back on to AppSec as they're writing up recommendations, checklist documentation, you know, rather than being prescriptive, don't do this, describe what you wanted. And you, you covered, I think all the points I was going to hit in terms of it. Does it just mean the rotation? Does it mean exposed to a human? And I would just, I'll add that one nuance too, in the sense of, you know, if you have an API key, but you're using it in sort of signed requests, like you're generating HMAX, that's very different because the, the API key isn't being exposed on the wire, even if it's over TLS, you're exposing the, the, the you're, you're signing it. If you're just sending the API key back and forth to make sure that you and I, you know, know the same secret, 
that's exposing it on the wire. And I think that speaks to what you were just saying about, can a human see this? And that is, I think, a much more important and useful intention to convey to then let developers say, well, we designed our, our, this is what our solution looks like. It meets the spirit of what you intended. It, it's, it's protecting the secret in a way that you wanted rather than just unchanging is the command from high. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And even this, remember when they used to make us change our passwords every two weeks? I worked for Cisco uh. in the late 2000s. <laughs> every two weeks, they would make, that's when, remember, iOS uh, code got exposed like 2006, 7, wherever it was. So they went into this policy of changing passwords every two weeks. And that had to be complicated passwords with uppercase, lowercase characters and everything. When you do that, the user ends up forgetting their password. So now you're causing a new problem. So I think the NIST recommendations, unless you have a reason to detect that that password has been compromised, don't ask the user to change it, right? So it's the same thing here. Unless you have a reason to say that this key is going to get seen somewhere, it's going to be like, maybe it's in a config file, it's not really secure versus I've used an HSM to protect this key, right? So it really depends on the risk and how you protected it, then you, you can take action in that manner. Oh, we're big fans of the NIST SP-863. Yeah, that is, uh, thank you for getting rid of that 90-day rotation. I can't even imagine trying to do it every two weeks. Oh, good luck. Um, th thankfully, you're still smiling and laughing about this. So it wasn't it wasn't uh, too too excruciating or, or traumatic for you. Um, maybe next time we have you on, we'll, we'll, we'll see if you can remember at least 10 of those passwords. You can rattle them off. And we'll, we'll, we'll judge you on how good they were. Um, but, but, in this, somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but in the spirit of clarification, I, I thought it was kind of, uh, you know, we had that, you know, that GitHub discussion, that issue discussion about ASVS. And there was a very short article I pulled in here. That's just it from um, Aaron Parecki, who is describing OAuth grant versus flow versus grant type. And it's literally one page. But it's kind of a rhetoric, it's a blog post that's trying to add some clarity. And so here's the spirit of documentation, which I'm a bit of a documentation nerd. I like writing, I like reading well-written and concise documentation, which I think are key parts of it. But it's just as we were talking about ASVS, this is just kind of a way to say, you know, OAuth, OAuth, OAuth uses these different terms, grant, flow, grant type. Are these clear? And so it's sort of just, you know, maybe an exercise for listeners. Do these explanations make sense? Would you rewrite them in a different way to try and be correct, accurate, and get the point across? Basically, use the Farshad principle. Did the intention come across? So I'm not sure if you've got something that you'd want to add to that, but that was really what, what spoke to me on what's very, you know, what's essentially guess, a very, very short article. No, it's a really good article. And the only thing I'll add is we need stuff like this. So OAuth is a complicated protocol. I don't know if you remember, Mike, but the, one of the authors quit. This was like in the early 2010s, right? And he left the project. He wrote this article that's been taken down. But he was like, I'm leaving this project. It's too difficult for even for us to understand, let alone people that are implementing it. It's like the, the security isn't inherent. You have to, you know, you have to put a lot of security around it. And by the time you figure all that stuff out, you're going to get something wrong. And in my experience doing consulting, a lot of people do get it wrong. Even I've even read articles from, you know, of zero and octa on their own page that they've got some of these things wrong. So these types of uh, you know short snippets really help people to really make sense out of a lot of things. And the more people that you know can make sense out of it, the more secure implementations we'll see. So yeah, this is quite valuable. And I'm so glad you're joining me for, for this week for the news because you're setting up all of the great articles for me in, in wonderful ways. Because as you're pointing out, OAuth can get really confusing, get messy. There's I, I can't remember, but there's at least a dozen, I think, uh, different RFCs that are around various aspects of it. There's an even RFC that is along along the lines of the title of how to use OAuth to you know implement it securely. Um, so it's kind of a that, that's sort of an anti pattern or perhaps a, a protocol smell, if you will, <laughs> if you have to do that. Um, <laughs> and here is an article about um, uh, the HTTP2 continuation flood. So, and I linked to both the technical details of it as well as the original blog post. It's just about the, the overview of what it is. And it speaks to me because perhaps as listeners know, I, I do like to, the, in addition to documentation, I like to geek out on protocols. Protocol analysis is fun because it's very much a design and implementation problem. It's almost completely agnostic to the underlying programming language. You could have a insecure protocol written in memory safe language, and this you know shows with some GoLang, with some MPS, et cetera. But what this boils down to is HTTP2 
has um, it's it, it's a binary protocol now. It has some frames that get passed back and forth between the client and server. So it's not so easy as just reading all the text from you know capturing it in uh, Perro's proxy or OWASP or you know Zap or um, what have you. But one of the things that it that the the researcher describes is that they saw the back in October the um, and now I just forgot what the um, the rapid reset attack from October 2023. They okay. thought, oh, this is pretty cool. I want to s- learn about HTTP2. So in the time frame between October 2023 and March, essentially, they went and looked at HTTP2 and saw, oh, there's these cool things about continuation frames and headers. But what if I just send this continuation frame in a header and say, I'm going to continue, and I'm going to continue, I'm going to continue. You might guess where this is going because I'm just going to continue forever and ever, but never send and end headers. And what they discovered is that this actually sets up a pretty decent denial of service. A couple of things about this are that um, on the one hand, from attacker's perspective, it, this is a nice type of denial of service because it's relatively asymmetric. They could send just a few headers and crash a server. They could send maybe a handful of multiple connections, crash a server, or just a single connection. And crash the server. So in other words, the resources that it takes for the attacker to affect the attack are much, much lower than the impact it has on the server. It's not just a blast of how much data can you fill a pipe in. The other thing they point out is that the RFC for HTTP2, the standard does talk about this a little bit. It does give some warning about handling, you know, zero length headers, handling, you know, continuation floods. But it was a little bit ambiguous in this area. And I think even you just use that term ambiguous as well in the sense of like OAuth 2 or just you know protocol specs or, or um, ASVS is what we're talking about as well. And that out of that ambiguity becomes implementation errors. And this is just one of those really interesting, stark examples of implementation error because it was ambiguous. It wasn't fully discussed and worked through. And that was my denial of service right. against uh, your attention right now <laughs> as I ramble on. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I'm taking a look at a bit more detail into this attack. It's quite interesting how it uses the um, you know, incorrect use of headers and the multiple continuation frames that ultimately lead to this denial of service. doesn't look like straightforward to do, though. It doesn't, and but it's, and it's one of those things that, um, you know, even if attack is complex, once it's written once, it becomes easy to replicate, right? Or for, for the most part. Um, Sounds like you can a, do an instant crash. After a yeah, and it, it also affected, you know, on the one of the blog posts I listed, uh, uh, linked to, was hitting Apache, Apache Tomcat, ATS, Envoy. It was hitting Golang, um, you know, Node.js. A lot of different um, open source projects were, getting, were, were affected by this because of the implementation problems. The nice thing is that this is also relatively easy to fix. Um, so, you know, there, there's a good and bad for this, but it was kind of neat to see that someone over the period of a few months of attention on a protocol found a new type of flaw, a bug that does need to be fixed, even though this protocol has been around for many, many years. So um, it, it maybe it's a little bit of that, you know, many eyes eventually find security, but eventually we need many eyes and eventually we'll find the security. So I think that's that, that uh, unspoken yeah. eventually is part of that uh, common phrase. There, there's one last article to, to take us out on is a little bit about secure design. And this is from the Chromium blog. Then they're talking about using device bound sessions. And this is important for a couple of reasons. One, obviously, I repeat quite a bit, even in today's intro, about passkeys, WebAuthn, FIDO2. This is all wonderful, phishing-resistant type of user authentication. All orgs should be adopting this in modern times. In 2020, If by the end of 2024, you at least don't have a budget to finish a deployment in 2025, you're behind the curve. You should be doing this. But as we've seen with, I think, Twitter, Uber, and others... If, the, if there is malware in your system that can steal a session token that's used in Slack, that session token gets generated post-strong authentication, and if that session token can be replayed. It doesn't matter if I'm a fan of WebAuthn and Passkeys. If Arshad has that Slack token, he can replay it and impersonate me and say, oh, by the way, I lost my iPhone. Can you reset my 2FA? 
that's some great social engineering. And we've seen that in practice. So what the device-bound sessions are trying to do is minimize that impact of that session theft and reuse from a different device. So I think this is a wonderful type of secure design that is a, that is targeting a very specific but important uh, threat related to authentication. Yeah, adding something, it becomes adding a, another factor of something you have, which gets bound to that physical machine. Mm-hmm. However, I just want to add something though. Why would that cookie get stolen in the beginning if you've set your secure flag HTTP only, same site and all that stuff? <laughs> so that's probably why it got stolen. So make sure if you're going to set that device cookie, that you also secure that, right? If you set a device cookie or get a device signature and you're also not protecting that, that can also be bypassed. So I think it's very important if they're setting those cookies to secure them and then also having something else like a device signature that identifies that this is coming from a, a recognized machine. So then it's equivalent to that, um, you know, the, the token that is representing, because I guess this is you know, the user's already gone through that biometric or whatever authentication. So this is now representing that and it's got right. to do that in a secure manner. Yeah, and I think one of the other scenarios too could be there's there's malware. Malware got downloaded on your system, and that's what's gone through and looked for you know pull the cookies off of the file system. So there's a couple yep. other failure yep. points, but your the the point here is it's not so much there might be another failure point, but what are the ways that we can minimize the impact of that particular failure? And device bound cookies are a great way to do it. One of the things I did want to highlight too is that there's, and I think I've said this before, there's a saying like you need security to have privacy because privacy relies on th- principles of encryption, confidentiality, things like that, integrity. But security can also erode privacy because there's one particular aspect as we talk about device bound sessions or even you no know, defense against bots. We want to identify is this is Mike, this is this one particular user. And here is now potentially an identifier that could be used to track them. And um, you know, we th- th- there's a given pull, a given pull, a pull. I'm messing up my my idioms now, but um, <laughs> of this of how do we track you know how do we track the identity of a person while still blinding things like advertisers or data brokers or data collectors of just being able to track someone across the the internet. And this, the blog post does point out some ways that it tries to address those types of privacy concerns so that this security tool that is a better way to assert the identity of an end user doesn't further erode that user's privacy. So it is nice to see that appreciation of both. I guess that's more of kind of a reminder of, I guess, for our AppSec friends out there to keep privacy in mind as, as working on application security types of things. And I think, Farshan, we have managed to go through all of the news of the week. Uh, this has been a great help to, um, to, to, to discuss these as well as the segment we did on the back door as well, the, the XZ back door. So I wanted to say thank you again for uh, sticking through and helping us talk through and having uh, filling in our listeners on just what, what does AppSec look like in, the, in April 2024. Thanks again for having me. Thanks to John and Akira. They'll be back soon. Thank you, Farshad. Thank you, everyone who's been listening. Please do subscribe, share on the socials, check out the show notes. And speaking of identity and things like that, XZ backdoor, check out Cruel Intentions from Magic Sword. We'll see you next time on Application Security Weekly.